Okay, wanted to take a moment to um, address the opposite side of conformity of the 1950s. Now, before you watch this video, do me one favor. Take a look at the, the two fashion articles that I have attached to this document. I think they do a nice job of kind of alluding to and discussing conformity in the 1950s as far as like what was expected of people as they dress and the types of um, you know, models that they wanted to portray to other people. Now, today will be part one of the rebellion against that 1950s conformity where people actually take a look at it and, and actually argue against it. And yes, there were those that did that. And more importantly, I'm going to have you do a small exercise at the back end of this lesson. I would like for you to post your answers on the comment stream for Google Classroom. Okay, so I just want to get that out there first and foremost. Uh, the one thing about the 1950s is what we we take a look at. It's like historically it's called the age of influ uh, affluence, excuse me, which means that a lot of people are doing rather, rather well. And so you kind of see the average family income triple. It's a lot more white collar jobs. And if you don't know what a white collar job, think of it as like an office job or a business job. Uh, your, your collar doesn't get dirtied up, if you will. And then there's always that keeping up with the Joneses mentality. And so if you don't know what that means, what that means is, okay, if your next door neighbor or friend bought something, you would buy it too to keep up that social standard. So back in the 1950s, the, you know, the family next door bought a TV. You were right there, right in line. But the one thing about the 1950s is, you know, in this rebellion against it is there, there's a lot going against it too. All right, you have... You know, the beginning of the civil rights movement in the 1950s. So the treatment of African-Americans, particularly in the South, is, is an all-time low. Uh, we have a lot of people in poverty. I know that the slide just before told you that the average income family triples, but there are a lot of people in poverty. Uh, unfavorable stereotypes uh, with any minorities there. And then American TV values are just something that could not be attained. Nobody is that perfect, okay? So um, if you want to kind of take a look at um, a protest song, if you will, against the 1950s conformity, check out Malvina Reynolds' Little Boxes song. And as you listen to that song, it's, it's a song that's kind of catchy, don't get me wrong, but it has a social message behind it. So when you think of that, you want to think of, you know, what do the little boxes in the first verse represent? And then more importantly, list the characteristics of the lifestyle described in the song. And what is the songwriter's point of view about the lifestyle of the people in it? First and foremost, this is not the assignment that I'm talking about that I want you to post. This is just for you. So if you wanted to stop the, the um, video at this point or pause it and go listen to that song, you might find out that you know it. And more importantly, if you do, or it's the first time you've heard it, Start thinking about these things when you listen to it. So I'll pause here for a second and allow you to do that. All right. Now, I'm guessing that you're back. So what I'm going to say is the little boxes they're referring to are those cookie cutter houses that are just flying up in 1950s America. They call it like Levitt Towns, where, you know, all the houses, single story, look the same. Cookie cutter means that they're going up as fast as they possibly can. And, you know, something else about them is that, you know, due to the fact that they looked all the same, that if you were to go up in an airplane and look down, you wouldn't be able to determine, you know, one house from the other. They look virtually all the same. And then also what it's talking about as far as the lifestyle uh, in the song is the unattainable family that you're seeing on TV. And so we watch that with the Leave it to Beaver episode. We have the old, older brother, the all-American boy good in all sports, respects the parents, plays the part uh, of the perfect friend. We got mom here at home, no matter what she's doing. She's dressed in her finest clothes with pearls. Dad, working that nine to five job, leader of the family. All kids look up to him. And the beeve is kind of supposed to be the comedic part, but, but, you know, he's also a great kid, too. So that's what it's putting across. But that kind of mentality, that kind of mentality, it just, it's unattainable. 
And it also talks about like the you know the business executives going to lunch and with their two drink uh, drinks at lunch, alcoholic drinks at lunch. That's that that's the expectation is they're all dressed the same in their same suit, and they're involved in the rat race, which is you know they're in the office working harder to earn more money to buy things and keep going over and over and over. Well, there's going to be a group that is going to come out and virtually call those people sheep, that you are just blindlessly, you know walking through life and you need to wake up and that's the group I kind of want to talk about today and that's what the assignment is going to kind of deal with the group that does that is a very it's a very small group they're called the beats the beats have a lot of um a lot more influence on history books than they would to people back in 1950s Geneseo and so what I mean by that is this is a lot of people did not know who they were at the time if you were not in like big cities like New York City Chicago, uh, San Francisco, then by all means, yes, you would know of the Beats and of their influence. But for the rest of the, of the population of Illinois and all around America, not so much well known. They become more well known as, as time has moved on. But they have one job, and it's to be a social critic. And it's to show the underside of 1950s America. Okay, So the things that you aren't seeing on the news, the things that you aren't seeing in Leave it to Beaver. And um, most famously, there's two uh, famous poets uh, of the beat generation, is uh, Jack Kerouac. I, I would imagine if, if you are planning on going to college, your first English class, you'll probably read his book, On the Road. Um, and then Allen Ginsberg, uh, yes, Ginsberg right here, excuse me, Allen Ginsberg, wrote probably one of the most uh, famous poems uh, called Howl with the beat poetry where he starts off with, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. And he keeps going on from there. But what the poem is telling Americans to do is cast away the rat race, get rid of the nine to five job and return to your animal instincts as well. But the one thing that they'll be remembered for in their writing style is this idea of a stream of consciousness. Okay. And what I mean by that is that you know, it's just one complete thought. So you just imagine yourself, you begin to talk and you continue to talk and you continue to talk and continue to talk until you get all these ideas out, depending on whatever topic you choose to talk about. That's what they do. And so that's what I want to do. I want you to practice the stream of consciousness. Okay. And so I'm going to take you through a little small uh, activity. And there's only two things. So in the, the comment section of this stream, I would like you to put your two answers for uh, the exercise we're about to do. All right. So the one thing that Beats would do is they would go to coffee houses, particularly in Greenwich Village, New York, and they would share their poetry with everybody, exposing the underside of American uh, 1950s culture. But a lot of what they were doing is just, you know, speaking off the top of their head of the things that they were seeing going down in America that time. Um, and jazz would be playing behind them. And when they got done with their their uh, poems, you know, rather than clap, rather than the cloud clapping, that would be too conformist, they would snap. They would snap. That was their thing. That was their uh, appreciation method as well. So without further ado, what I'm going to have you do is this. For, for your first answer, I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to take a couple deep, deep breaths. I just want you to relax. And then in a moment, as you're breathing and relaxing, I want you to try to clear your mind of everything. Just get rid of everything in there. Very difficult to do. But just let it clear. Take away all thought. And then in a moment, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something. And the first thing that pops in your mind, I want you to write down for your first answer in the comment stream. So breathe. Clear the mind. Breathe. Clear the mind. Eyes closed. Clear your mind. Now what I want you to do for your first answer is tell me what animal on earth best represents you. Whatever comes to your mind, write it down now. Okay. All right, good. So our first answer would be what animal best represents us? 
Okay, you don't need some sort of fancy reasoning why. Just write down what came to your mind. All right, part two of the stream of consciousness. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna relax again. We're gonna close our eyes. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tell you to do something. And when I give you that prompt, I need you to do it. Here we go. Relax. Now, one thing I would have you do is just be ready to begin to type. So make sure that your hands are close to the computer, but your eyes are still closed. And you're still breathing, but more importantly, you're clearing your mind. You're clearing your mind. Breathe. Relax. Breathe. Relax. Breathe. And relax. Clear minds. Clear minds. Okay. When I say go, I want you to begin to type what is ever going on in your mind. Ready? Go. Whatever is in your mind right now, whatever you're seeing, what's ever going through it, you begin to type. What words are being said to you? All right, stop. Stop. Make sure whatever you wrote down that came into your mind, you put down for your second answer in the comment stream. Please make sure it's classroom and school appropriate. But make sure you write that down. And congratulations. You have just written your first beat poem using the stream of consciousness. That's what it is. It's clearing one's mind. And then all of a sudden, just letting out what is ever in one's mind all down. It might make sense. It might, it might not, but I can't wait to read them. So in the comment section below, uh, and we'll say I, I would like this done by, by next Monday, uh, do me the favor of writing the two answers to the beat activity, which is number one, which was what animal best represents you, and number two, when I told you to go, I gave you 45 seconds to write down what is ever in your mind. That's a stream of consciousness. Don't think about it. Just write it, and you're not going to be judged. So if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please, please, please uh, be in contact with me, and I will talk to you soon.